Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to present our recent uh, work on this context of more remote insulators. Uh, it's a privilege to follow this uh, beautiful talk by Kinfai Mack. So I'm going to talk about um, two uh, kind of related uh, projects on spin liquids and uh, doping some of these more remote insulators. This is mostly joint work with uh, Zen Hao Song, who's a graduate student at UCSB, Sushi Luo, uh, you know, who's in the audience, as well as Leon. So uh, the main motivation here has been already presented by um, Kinfai Max, so I can be very brief, but um, in general, we want to study these Moray super lattices of uh, 2D van der Waals materials, so you assemble two layers uh, at a finite twist angle. And why is this interesting coming from a magnetism standpoint? Well, basically, by creating this Moray super lattice, you're creating an uh, emergent lattice of these um, uh, Moray uh, sites, basically. And the lattice constant of this emergent Moray lattice just scales roughly inversely proportional to the twist angle. So if we think about electronic energy scales in our system, so this is uh, very much a cartoon argument, and there are a couple of caveats here. But the kinetic energy, if you think about p squared over 2m, scales as an inverse length squared, whereas the Coulomb interaction scales as uh, an inverse length scale. So that means by manipulating the uh, Moray lattice constant here, by tuning the twist angle, we can achieve really high values of uh, kinetic versus um, Coulomb interactions. In particular, we can go into a regime where interactions are strongly dom dominant, um, as has been demonstrated um, by Kinfeimer. So yeah, one of these uh, first experiments in this uh, field, um, following this proposal by Alan, Alan McDonald, was on tungsten diselenide on tungsten disulfide. You've seen this plot already. Uh, so here, I'm still using the old convention of uh, filling factor of one half, basically. But this here is exactly the strongly enhanced resistance at half filling in this triangular lattice uh, moray material. Let me mention here that in this material, the tungsten disulfide layer, basically, because of the strong band misalignment, provides a Moray super lattice potential for this um, tungsten diselenide band. Because of strong spin orbit coupling, you have this spin valley locking. Uh, and you can think about this uh, combined spin valley as your two degree of freedom at low energies. So Kinfai uh, Mack has already shown this curie weiss plot. So you can imagine that on this triangular lattice, you, you now have local moments um, that are basically coming from these half felt electrons at a half filling, or holes here. I'm always implicitly doing particle hole transformations. Um, and uh, from this Curie-Weiss plot, you can extract, so in this insulating phase here, um, um, uh, antiferromagnetic exchange of interactions of roughly half a Kelvin. So from these experimental parameters, you can make estimates that here in this uh, system, U is roughly on the order of 15 MeV, and this uh, ratio of U over 2 is rather large, so it's roughly 20. Okay, so this was for half filling. Now it becomes a lot more interesting, or even more interesting, if you go to fractional fillings. So here, transport experiments are a lot more difficult. So um, these experimental groups, they use uh, um, slightly different techniques um, based on exciton sensing. So they have an additional layer of tungsten diselenide and basically probe this exciton in this uh, uh, tungsten diselenide layer. And because the field lines essentially still permeate through three-dimensional space, you can use this as a tool to basically probe the dielectric constant in your, in your sample here. So then they show you these plots here. Um, and these have a lot of features. But basically, the main takeaway is that you can tune the gate voltage here. And you are basically um, um, measuring um, this um, 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 contrast of this exciton here. And each of these features here can be assigned with the incompressible state. And you can see that there's really this plethora of uh, incompressible states at various fractional fillings. So what do these states correspond to? So um, in the previous talk, we've already heard this name Wigner crystal. This has really been demonstrated in experiments by Fang Wang groups, uh, Fang Wang's group. Um, so here, um, you can basically do STM imaging of these Wigner crystal states, at least at certain filling fractions. So in the triangular lattice case, where you just have this half filled triangular moray lattice, you can see this uh, triangular uh, lattice basically of charges. If you now go to this honeycomb system, you can see by these red dots, I hope it's visible, that you have an emergent honeycomb lattice on your triangular lattice. So you occupy two out of the three sublattices of the triangular lattice. If you add um, um, quarter filling in this triangular lattice system here, you realize a stripy phase where you have a, a basically period uh, two stripe phase. 
And it has been proposed, so this has been simulated, for instance, in uh, Monte Carlo simulations, that if you go to three-quarter filling, you realize an effect of cargo meal lattice. So let me emphasize that by basically having one single device, by tuning the filling, you can realize essentially these different emergent lattices of half-filled sites. So this is, of course, very interesting from a uh, magnetism standpoint, because here I'm only showing the occupancy of these sites, but still at low energies, we still have these SU2 degrees of freedom at each site, so we can think basically about how these uh, spin degeneracies of these uh, sort of local moments in these Wigner crystal phases get lifted. And in particular, the triangular lattice and, of course, the Kagome lattice, these are strongly frustrated lattices, so uh, we expect that here we might find uh, interesting magnetic states. Okay, so what could you do? So you could uh, now take this Hubbard model for the Vanier centers on your Moray super lattice uh, and now do what you typically do with such a Hubbard model if you're interested in magnetic states and do T over U perturbation theory. So this has been done, for instance, in the group by Luke Rademacher. And the, the, um, the point here is that if you want to study uh, something else than half filling, you explicitly need to set a particular charge configuration and then crank your T over U uh, perturbation theory. And you can see it gets quite involved because you now have also hopping processes via these intermediate empty sites. So it's a rather, uh, rather laborious uh, um, a method. And in particular, you need to repeat this for every charge configuration or any uh, generalized Wigner crystal. You basically have to start from scratch. Um, so instead of basically studying these effective spin models, uh, we want to um, uh, take a different route and have a more integrated approach. So we want to find a method where we simultaneously can describe the charge ordering, so these generalized Wigner crystals that uh, have been seen at fractional fillings. And also on top of these um, uh, Wigner crystal states, we want to see possible exotic magnetic states. So and to do this, we use a slave rotor mean field theory. Okay, this has uh, been doubled here. So basically in this slave rotor mean field theory, we um, split the uh, hole, or in here I'm using the convention to talk about electrons. Uh, we split the electron into a, a fermionic spinon, which carries uh, spin but no charge, and a U1 charge rotor degrees of freedom, uh, which yeah, describe the, the charges, basically. So if I uh, use the slave rotor representation, basically the, the charge number on each side corresponds to the angular momentum of this uh, U1 charge rotor. And, um, of course, as in any slave particle construction, by doing this rewriting, I'm uh, really increasing the size of my local Hilbert space on each side. So I need to impose a constraint. In principle, we should do this exactly, that the uh, number of charges on the side basically is consistent with the number of uh, fermionic spinons that I have on a given side. Okay, now I use this uh, slave rotor uh, representation and uh, stick this into my um, uh, Hubbard model. So here I'm keeping basically the kinetic energy on site and uh, longer range repulsive terms. And you can see that the uh, repulsive terms, they map into interactions, quadratic interactions between the rotor angular momenta. And the kinetic energy uh, of, of um, your electrons in the Hubbard model, this has now become this uh, correlated topping of these um, uh, fermionic spinons and these uh, charge rotors. This is still a strongly interacting problem that we cannot solve exactly. So as a first step, we make a mean field decoupling where we separate this problem into um, fermionic and uh, rotor Hamiltonians. And these are now coupled by um, um, self-consistent mean field equations. So the um, uh, hopping of the spinons is related uh, to the hybridization of these uh, charge rotors and the um, uh, kinetic energy of these rotor degrees of freedom is related to the, uh, basically, uh, hopping amplitude of these uh, fermionic spinons. And in addition now, I'm using uh, this Lagrange multipliers to enforce uh, this constraint on average. Okay, so the fermionic Hamiltonian, this is just something that quadratic, so we can straightforwardly evaluate this, uh, diagonalize it and evaluate these expectation values in our mean field loop, but on the other hand, these uh, rotor Hamiltonians, this is still like a quantum XY problem, so uh, even this Hamiltonian we still cannot solve exactly. So we make a second mean field approximation where we decouple this quantum XY problem into local rotor Hamiltonians. So this is a standard mean field decomposition, and one thing I want to emphasize here is that if you locally place yourself into an eigenstate of uh, the rotor angular momentum, 
these mean fields e to the i theta in principle would be zero. But of course, in our mean field theory, uh, we still should have a, a, a non-zero non basically hybridization between these rotors. So we use perturbation theory to basically get a finite um, a hybridization of these uh, rotors on different sides, even if we are basically in a, in a state or a regime where the um, uh, expectation value of e to the i theta is zero. Okay, so we can solve these mean field equations self-consistently uh, using uh, iterative procedures. And this is a phase diagram that we obtain. So this is only um, basically for on-site and nearest neighbor repulsion V. So here we have fixed some value. Um, the y-axis is uh, u over t, so you crank up interaction as you go to the top of the phase diagram. And here I'm uh, tuning the gate voltage, and I'm uh, using a mostly chemi positive chemical potentials. So that means that I'm um, um, basically electron doping my system, or hole doping in, in, um, in, the, in the Morel language. Um, OK, so here we have these various phases. Let me briefly talk you through them. Uh, so uh, for weak interactions and near half filling, you have this metallic state. Then if you crank up interactions, as you would expect, you enter this half-filled triangular lattice uh, mod insulator. Then we have this big chunk where we have this filling 4 over 3, which corresponds to this effective honeycomb lattice crystal, where you have um, two out of the three sublattices of the triangular lattice, which are half-filled, and then uh, these uh, third sublattice sites are doubly occupied. The 5 over 3 state is basically the, the mirror image of this guy. And then in addition, we also have these interesting metallic states where you have certain intermediate sites which are doubly occupied, but the remaining sites of your um, uh, honeycomb sublattice have fractional spill, uh, filling. So this is, corresponds to a, basically, again, a metallic um, uh, compressible state. OK, if you now go to a longer range interaction, so a switch on a V prime, which is uh, next, nearest repulsion, next nearest neighbor repulsion, we get um, more interesting states which go beyond the square root 3 by square root 3 uh, unit cells. In particular, um, we can reproduce these stripy phases here and this effective cargo may lattice that I had been uh, advertising earlier. Okay, uh, so this is again only talking about the charge configuration of these uh, states. So now we can ask about the spin physics of these uh, um, uh, systems. And here we should now look into the um, um, spin on um, part of our Hamiltonian basically and investigate different ansätze for the spin on dispersion on our system. Um, so we have done this, for instance, on the triangular lattice case, um, and here we make uh, use basically different ansätze for the spin, spin on mean field um, 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 parameters, um, which can be classified in terms of their relative uh, projective symmetry groups. And we can see here, so this black line is just the metallic um, state that we have this metal insulator transition. So on this axis, we have U over T. And then um, the lowest energy state out of these uh, different uh, spinon ansätze is a dimer state. So and this is a state where the spinons have decoupled hoppings on, on basically uh, neighboring uh, sites. Uh, but you do, do not have any uh, basically spinon bands in this case. So, so this state here on the mean field level is completely degenerate. So uh, any arbitrary uh, dimer configuration of uh, basically spin on de decoupled spin on hoppings will achieve the same energy on a mean field level. So we can also do the same game on the Kagome Wigner crystal, and we again find that this green curve here, the dimer state, is the lowest energy. But what I want to point out in both of these uh, plots is that this blue curve, which corresponds to U U1 Dirac ansatz respectively, so here a staggered flux, and on the Kagome lattice similarly. Um, has a very low competitive energy to this dimer solution. Okay, so I've mentioned that these um, dimer states are degenerate. Uh, in principle, if you now go beyond mean field theory, uh, basically in higher order in k over u or t over u, um, we expect that this degeneracy gets lifted of these different dimer states, and there are two different scenarios. So on the one hand, you could basically stabilize some type of VBS order, or you could end up with the Z2 RVB state. Um, in general, the fact that we have these U1 Dirac spin liquids, which are quite close in energy to the dimer states, makes us somewhat hopeful that beyond mean field theory, so if you really do a good Spiller projection here, that you might stabilize this quantum spin liquid state. So this is well known in the uh, literature on spin liquids that sometimes you get these dimer states as artifacts of your uh, mean field decouplings. Okay, um, um, in, in the interest of time, let me maybe skip this part. 
and come to the conclusion of this first part of my um, talk. So we've uh, come up with a slave rotor mean field theory for spin liquids and uh, dimer states on basically these emergent charge lattices in these Wigner mod insulators. Um, and in principle, um, uh, these quantum spin liquids are rather competitive states. Let me emphasize that in these samples, because you have a small number of spins, right? These are thin samples and you have these large lattice constants. Um, neutron scattering, which we have talked about a lot in this program, is not an applicable to, uh, probe to resolve uh, dynamic correlations in your system. So instead, we need new experimental probes to basically resolve something else than ferromagnetism in these systems. Um, let me also mention that in our study so far, we have um, excluded conventional magnetic order. Um, here, we would need some quantitatively accurate uh, methods to really compare um, the competitiveness of various states. Okay, let me now switch gears a little bit and talk about doping dilute Wigner mod insulators. And here in particular, we are modulated by these charge crystals that have been found at rather dilute filling fractions. So one example in this tungsten diselenide, tungsten disulfide um, uh, system would be the one-third filling case. So where you have um, basically, a, 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 where you occupy one of the three sublattices of your triangular lattice. Another uh, Example for such a system would be in um, a twisted uh, molybdenum diselenide. This is a gamma valley CMD at quarter filling. So again, here you have the case where you occupy one out of the two sublattices of the honeycomb uh, uh, system here. And this is a similar scenario to what uh, Kinfai Mack has talked about in, con in the context of the Cetro bilayer, where this was explicitly stabilized by basically this charge transfer energy. Here, these states can in principle also be stabilized just by longer range uh, Coulomb interactions. Okay, so a key feature here of these systems is that now these charges here don't have any neighboring, nearest neighbor pairs anymore. So that means that if we now want to compute uh, basically uh, effective exchange interaction between these, um, uh, between two local moments, between two localized charges, we can quickly convince ourselves that we actually need to go to fourth order perturbation theory uh, in T over U to get a finite splitting. So you can see that, for example, you would need to move these charges to this side here where they can experience uh, on-site repulsion U and then they would need to hop back and this would generate an effective spin interaction. So this means that these effective exchange interactions should roughly go as T over U to the fourth. If you plug in these values, for instance, for tungsten diselenide and tungsten disulfide, you get exchange interactions which are extremely, extremely sm small, so really tiny energy scales. So this means that this is not here something that you would ever see in an experiment, um, probably. So we can, this led us to ask, are there any other mechanisms which might help basically to stabilize some kind of magnetic order apart from uh, basically these uh, exchange interactions in these systems? So and this led us to consider doping these systems with an additional electron. So for instance, in this honeycomb geometry, if I place an uh, additional electron here, you can see that now you have these nearest neighbor pairs. So we can now write down, a, again, um, an effective Hamiltonian for the system, basically, um, um, uh, of, of, of this uh, doped electron interacting with the local moments. And um, um, you can convince yourself that, um, basically, at second order perturbation theory, there are effective hopping processes where this doped electron basically disperses of the sublattice of empty sites. So that means that our effective Hamiltonian has a kinetic energy term. And then in addition, there are two further terms which look like um, condo interactions. So the second term here, this JK2, this corresponds to basically a spin flip assisted hopping. So by creating a virtual Dublon excitation, this guy can move to, again, another sublattice site by, it, by flipping its uh, um, a spin uh, or exchanging its spin with one of the local moments. In addition, we also have this more conventional condo interaction where basically the doped electron exchanges its spin with one of these uh, local moments. So this is uh, the effective uh, Hamiltonian for this guy interacting with the uh, local moments. And so far, I've only talked about second order perturbation theory here, right? So all of these interactions here are now on the order of T squared over U. And this is a crucial point because this means that there's now a parametrically large temperature regime where this Hamiltonian here is much more important compared to the intrinsic exchange interactions. So this Hamiltonian here can be thought of as basically the dominant source for lifting the spindle genesis of these localized charges in this intermediate temperature regime 
which is again parametrically large. So what's the resulting state that is being induced by this Hamiltonian? Again, I want to focus just on doping a single electron here. And uh, so far, this Hamiltonian has um, uh, complete uh, spin rotation symmetry. So that means that the total spin projection of the spin of the local moments and the doped electron is um, a good quantum number. And we can basically split our Hilbert space into the sectors of um, the total spin projection. So that means that the highest byte representation contains n states where I have a polarized states on the, for the local moments, and I have n, so if I have n uh, unit cells, n possibilities of distributing this uh, doped electron. Then in the next sector, I can place the spin down electron again on n sides, and now I can also form uh, states in this sector where I have a doped up electron and a spin flip. So this roughly gives me n squared states. And so then you can work your way basically down and label all these different sectors. So we've done exact diagonalization of this one hole problem or one electron problem in, this, uh, in the, these uh, first few sectors. And you can see that in the sector of n plus one over two, you just get this uh, red curve here, which is precisely this dispersion of this doped electron and polarized background. In the next sector, you can see this uh, gray continuum. And this gray continuum basically corresponds to two particle states uh, of um, a doped electron and, uh, and a spin flip, a magnon. But what you can also see that um, near the gamma point, you have this additional sharp mode extending below the continuum. And this, of course, now would correspond to a bound state uh, that basically extends out of this um, electron um, magnon continuum. You can think about this bound state as a, a spin polaron. So it's like a bound state between a doped electron and a magnon. Uh, so this is, in general, a parameterization of the wave function in the sector. And we can uh, expect this bound state wave function from uh, our exact diagonalization. And we see that it really indeed uh, exponentially decays as a function of the relative distance between these two guys. And we've also solved the Schrodinger equation for a G um, uh, basically perturbatively in J over T. And we find that there's indeed the bound state and the bound state energy is uh, linear in J over T. Um, furthermore, if we now go to lower sectors, of course we get uh, copies of this bound state just mandated by spin rotation symmetry. But uh, crucially, we do not find any additional bound states in lower sectors, so in particular in the sector of n minus 3 over 2. So this leads us to expect that this one electron problem, so um, uh, n local moments uh, in addition to one doped electron, um, uh, has a ground state which lies in the sector of n minus 1 over 2. And this sector can be described basically as a ferromagnetic state with exactly one spin polaron as described here. So this is also consistent with uh, strong coupling perturbation theory, so kind of the opposite limit uh, to uh, what we studied um, um, previously. So here I first solve the basically condo interaction part of my Hamiltonian. Um, and if you diagonalize the condo interaction, you find that basically these three neighboring local moments and the doped electron form a spin one representation. And now I can play, uh, apply basically a hopping term for this doped electron. And then we want to form basically a new condo cluster on this uh, other side here, uh, basically. And I can now find matrix elements that connect these two uh, clusters. So I can write down an effective uh, hopping uh, Hamiltonian for these objects and di block diagonalize it. And I find that the kinetic energy is maximal if the uh, total spin of this uh, six sin, uh, if the total spin of this six spin uh, object here, so these uh, five local moments and the doped electron lies in the sector where we have uh, spin two, which is exactly the maximum spin minus one. So this is again consistent with the expectation that we have ferromagnetic order with one spin polaron on top. Okay, so so far I've only talked about the um, uh, basically a single doped electron case. Uh, now let me extend to finite doping. So that means that I want to uh, consider uh, doping with a small density x, which is still assumed to be a lot smaller than one. So this picture that you start with this Wigner crystal and weakly perturbed still holds. Uh, and in this limit here, it's kind of justified. And this uh, is indeed what uh, Kinfai Mack has shown. The condo coherence temperature drops to zero uh, for small doping densities. Um, so here um, we make a mean field approximation. So if we have a weak condo screening. I place these local moments in some um, classical magnetic order. Here for simplicity, I'm assuming a single Q, a spiral state for the um, um, uh, spins. 
and now I can uh, basically optimize um, Q uh, or uh, find the minimum mean field energy of this guy with respect to Q. And I find that in particular for small uh, conduction electron fillings, uh, the minimum uh, is found exactly at Q equals zero, which is consistent with the uh, ferromagnetic order. This also can be understood from an effective RKKY interaction. If you expand the spin susceptibility for small KF, which corresponds to this uh, basically weak doping density, so my conduction band basically has extremely small KF, um, I get this logarithmic uh, component, which is negative for small KF over R. So this is again uh, consistent. So this is uh, the um, um, picture basically that you should have in mind for this uh, system. So we have this ferromagnetic background, and in principle we have two different particle types. So we can think about the effective two-band model. So on the one hand, I have doped spin-up electrons, and in addition, I can also form these uh, doped uh, basically spin polarons. And um, at weak fields, I would expect that, um, as I've shown earlier, the ground state uh, has just a finite density of spin polarons on top of this ferromagnetic order. So this would correspond to a basically magnetization plateau at weak uh, doping densities of one minus x over two. This is because this uh, spin polarons state here has effectively a uh, spin quantum number of minus one half. So I'm pairing up a spin up electron with a spin flip, so it's uh, one half minus one, right? Okay, so now if we crank up a field, um, so this can be seen in MCD experiments, basically the magnetization as a function of the field. If I crank up a field, um, um, first of all, I, I stay at fixed filling, so that means that I just uh, I'm, am I in, in this uh, plateau phase here, but at some point, uh, this splitting between the um, band of uh, spin-up electrons and the polarons here will become decreased because of the Zeeman splitting, basically, of these two bands. And at some point, it's favorable to basically start filling this conduction electron uh, spin-up band. So this is this regime where you just have a basically linear growth in the magnetization as a function of field. And then, of course, at high fields, I'm just in the saturated regime where I now have a density of uh, 1 plus x over 2. So this is a key signature, um, which uh, seems quite quite uh, unique for this state. This might be a smoking gun here. Um, of course, let me say that if you start already with sufficiently high doping densities, there's a chance that you also already start doping basically into this up electron band. So that means as a function of field, you immediately see this linear onset and you do not actually see this uh, plateau at low, um, low fields. So this is effectively a phase diagram here that we, um, or schematic phase diagram that corresponds to this. Uh, so the first case would correspond to some cut along uh, uh, this direction here, as the second case uh, corresponds to a case where you uh, basically kill this um, um, uh, low field plateau. Um, okay, I, I wanted to talk about recent experimental progress, but Kinfai Mack uh, has basically given exactly the, the motivation here, or his uh, results. I was very glad to hear this, so I'm just going to skip this. Um, come to my conclusions, so in the first part, um, I've um, given you some um, details on the uh, slave rotor mean field theory, uh, which might be able to describe spin liquids or uh, VPS states um, and for uh, fractional fillings in these frustrated spin systems, basically. And in the second part, uh, we have investigated the spin polaron physics in these uh, doped uh, um, uh, Moray mod insulators. With this, uh, let me thank you for your attention. Questions? So I have one question each part. In the first part, I'm trying to understand in what sense the theory you're doing is, um, uh, goes way beyond the most obvious thing, where you start with the Mott Hubbard model in the one year basis with full band structure mm -hmm. and calculate quantum phase diagram by doing self-consistent mean field on that, you know, kind of things. The most obvious thing like we did. And we also get like, Every magnetic phase that anybody has talked about, we find, and we found many magnetic phases that nobody talked about. But you are doing something more, and I'm missing right. why do I need to do that? I'm, I'm trying to understand, other than the spin liquid angle, which I completely understand. Yes, I mean, that's exactly that's the, the reason. Yeah. Okay, good, yeah. good. <laughs> that's, that's what you want, spin liquid, good. Yeah. But yeah. as you said, I mean, it'll be, very, diffi us, uh, yeah. okay, so it'll be yeah. very difficult to see the spin liquid, okay? Yeah. Second part, second, that's what I thought, but I wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It basically uh, gives us, uh, yeah. by 
basically looking at the no, no, so I, I looking at the spin on Hamiltonian gives us an immediate access to. I, I totally get yeah. it. That okay. spin liquid yeah. is a good. Since okay. I don't believe in spin liquid, that part is not so. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so second part is that you know that when you are doing small doping of these uh, phases around fractional field, there's a lot of disorder in this system that people don't talk about. Okay, it's, right. it's kind of a dirty secret. I mean, we are talking 20% Coulomb disorder. Okay, mm -hmm. so it will be very difficult, and you know, I have written papers of seeing anything which ignore disorder. Basically, it's neither the, always neither the mod of a regular limit, registrivity is like 1,000 ohm per square, and so on. So it's a, there are theories one can do, but without disorder, I think that it's not clear that it will make connect. Right. Experimental yeah. samples could improve, then. I fully concur. Yeah. It's, uh... Yeah, I have a question about the second part of the talk. Um, so here you show the exchange interaction is T squared over U. Uh -huh. but, but I would th think that if you have a honeycomb lattice, there are unoccupied sites, so there are ways of uh, 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 deriving a, a interaction, effective interaction without without paying the energy cost of U. Um, so uh, okay, um, so here the the honeycomb case that I'm really thinking about is basically a, a twisted homo bilayer, right? So I, um, I I don't have any uh, intermediate sites in the center here. Is that so I'm not talking I mean, about the... They are like second order process in T squared, but it doesn't involve U as denominator, right? I can have a half, let's say, occupy B side electron uh, to the A side, and then its uh, position is replaced by a neighboring, neighboring, you know, yeah, if you go back to the, the slide. Uh, uh, the, yeah, here, to yeah, this here. Guy? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so yeah. for example, if the, the... Oh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, so here, when I yeah. say it's T squared over U, I'm oversimplifying, you're absolutely right. So there's uh, basically also contribution T squared over V in here. Um, uh, but here, we are assuming that basically U roughly scales as, or V roughly scales as U. So, uh, fine, so fine, if fine. we talk, talk about orders, we need to make some assumption, right? If you, if you want to organize a perturbative expansion, you somehow need to, yeah, make, like some uh, basically statement about how u scales relative to v or vice versa. Okay, fine. So, so yeah, this may be related to my second question, uh -huh. which is uh -huh. that um, so you think of this spin polaron as as um, as more uh, center around the, the, the unoccupied site, right? Uh, right. I mean, an alternative yeah. picture would be, um, you know, you can think of it as more like a Zhang Rice singlet in the charge transferring suitor. So, uh, sorry, as a as a Zhang Rice singlet. It's a bit like a doublon. Okay. Uh huh. Right. So in other right. words, uh, the uh, at the half filling, you have a, a a triangle lattice, and you are doping additional electrons into uh, unoccupied sites. Right. Yes. That's a bit like a yes. you know at least yes. in the Kubrick context, yes. a Zhang-Rai singlet. Mm -hmm. And in that case, then uh, you have triangle lattice, and you have a, a doublons. Right. Zhang-Rai singlet is mm -hmm. sort of like doublon. Mm -hmm. Then doublon, uh, kin kinetic mechanism of doublon can lead to fermionism. I see. So I, I wonder, you know, if you have thought about this, and you know, if there's. I, I have not. Any, yeah, it would be good to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Other questions? My question would be on the. Um, you, so you look, you constructed the, the the polaron wave function, so to say, right? Right. Yes. Um, and and um, I would have expected that the polaron polaron interaction would be repulsive, or. Uh, right, yeah, so here we uh, completely neglect interactions basically between these polarons, which is kind of under the assumption that you are ex extremely weak doping densities, so they basically rarely uh, see each other. But, but uh, could, could, do, can you estimate it from, 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 from your method, or could you? Do you uh, sure, in principle, to... I mean, uh, you could basically now take this wave function and compute the overlap uh, between these two guys as a function of separation, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have any estimate of, of the top of my head. But, Thank you. Uh, Thank yeah, you. it's possible. So I have a question on the first part. Uh -huh. So now, of course, you can um, extend to fillings, to metallic fillings, and maybe try to investigate superconductivity, whether these triangular lattice, um, Hubbard model, um, with all these features, their superconductivity. I guess that the spin rotor um, type of mean field um, can you uh, go into, met I, I guess it's more difficult there to, yeah, to so, test these uh, metallic states? So the, so the metallic states, of course, uh, these guys we can access rather, I mean, it's um, on, on the mean field picture in the slave rotor um, theory. The metallic states are basically characterized by having a non-zero non uh, expectation value of e to the i theta, right? 
not immediately um, sure how to, what the best avenue would be to inst mm. um, basically study superconducting. Yeah, it could be interesting just yeah. to see whether yeah. the, the model um, yeah. bears uh, superconducting. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I was thinking that mm -hmm. the, this type of min field is probably difficult to... Yeah, it's, uh, not, it's not obvious to yeah, me what, uh, what terms you should switch on. Um, I mean, we have to define the... Yeah, you need to somehow parameter. now break. I mean, you have a, a basically, uh, when you do this, you have like a U1 um, uh, symmetry in your system, right? Uh, uh, e to the I theta. Um, so let me show the Hamiltonian maybe. Uh, now you need to think, so if I just uh, think about terms like uh, C dagger, C dagger, if I, if I basically, so this is a term where I just have uh, normal hopping and repulsive interactions, right? And if I by hand add a, basically a, um, anomalous uh, pairing term in there, this would have a term where I have now e to the i theta, uh, theta, theta i plus theta j, right? Mm -hmm. um, Need to think like about like higher order mean fields of these e to the these rotors. Yeah, uh, it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So can you uh, maybe you shown, uh, but I didn't see, I didn't uh, not, uh, pay much attention to the, things, to the dispersion of your polarons. The dispersion. The I guess the second part. Um, so I have written down an effective two-band model, but um, um, I don't think I have a plot for the dispersion. I have a picture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so these are schematic pictures, but basically, yeah, it's a, it's a band. No, but oh. Okay, so where's the minimum of the dispersion is? Oh, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I can just, yeah, I can just show you this, right, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. so it's at gamma. Yeah, 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 so gamma. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry, yeah, <laughs> thanks. And, 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 and then, so, kind of, in old Hubble, Hubbard models, people study a lot incommensurate magnetic state. Mm -hmm. Any estimate, I mean, you have an idea how it can emerge in your uh, uh, approach? If it does, but just uh, in comments with um, yeah, I um, yeah, it's a good. Uh, so basically, you uh, one could I wonder like if if you have a band minimum somewhere else and the the polaron lives somewhere else at non-zero k, right? Um, it's not clear to me. Yeah. Uh, Maybe by playing around with like T1, T2. So here we have really used the minimal model where we only have like nearest neighbor uh, hopping as well, right? Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I, I was just wondering, in the regime where your charges are localized, like you have some Wigner crystal uh -huh. uh, in the slave. Slave description, uh, slave decoupling description. Right. Then you get also magnetic order. In principle, the magnetic order. Uh, so we don't because it uh, really depends on uh, basically. Uh, at, Isn't it? It depends on basically the slave rotor. Uh, the the. Okay. Ah. Um, the the, uh, the basically the the spin on Hamiltonian, right? Um, so. It, so, really depends on so the spins are somehow in a spin liquid state, but you break translation symmetry by the Wigner crystal. Um, so the right, but in, in principle, uh, you can now also allow for like a decoupling here in this um, um, uh, fermionic Hamiltonian, where you have like some expectation value of s basically or f dagger sigma f right on each side. But that's not the state you're describing the spin liquid state? Or? Uh, the st we are completely focusing on spin liquids and uh, okay. non-magnetic states, basically. But in principle, you can incorporate this here but as if, well. But yeah. if you had magnetic ordering as well, then that would be just an, another way of describing, you know, without decoupling, you could just describe that with two mean fields from the original Hamiltonian, like without any fractionalization. Right, yeah. You oh, you're, oh you're, you're saying then I could just, uh, yeah. Uh, you could just introduce, like, charge. 
Well, I, I guess. Uh, is that equivalent? Or? You're talking about the the uh, basically effective spin Hamiltonian that I would derive. Uh, well, you start out with the Hubbard model, and then uh -huh. you would derive kind of coupled charge density wave, spin density wave coupled right. bosonic Hamiltonian. Yes. So is that equivalent to the, to the phase you would go to here when you order spins? I mean, f philosophically, yes. Um, uh, okay, but the idea is here, it allows you access to Exactly, it gives you access states. to like basically fractalized uh, states. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I guess this is this is perhaps a minor point, but mm -hmm. again, coming to you back to your polyron uh, picture. Mm -hmm. There are many magnetic polyrons. Uh, some uh, discussed in manganese. It's more like conga coupling with conga coupling of spins. Mm -hmm. There are some in TJ model which are more strongly coupled. And one effect there I remember, which was uh, important, is that uh, your polyronic band gets renormalized really considerably compared with the bare, uh, what would be expected as bare electronic one, because uh, exactly because of the coupling with the continuum of spin excitations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if uh, maybe you have a paramagnetic state which is not fluctuating or something, but uh, this uh, should be avoidance of your bound state rather than, uh, that rather than just entering the continuum. Um. I was lost in okay. the hierarchy of scales. I couldn't. I couldn't make whether you know whether you are in which regime you are. So, um, I mean, here this is just uh, um, uh, really an exact diagonalization in some spect a sector of your Hilbert space, right? This is just the, the paramagnetic sector. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. So yes. Then, yes. Then, yeah. Once you have fluctuations. You okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Interested mm. in fluctuations. Okay. Are there any more questions? Okay. Let's thank um, our speaker.